our fifth and final talk of the evening is by Georgina Hoseng, who is a lecturer at Goldsmiths uh, University of London and also um, works on the London Mood Project, which, which is a really interesting project. Read the journal to learn more um, about trying to understand pe um, how people interact with the environment in terms of how they feel in London. Um, very recently, we had Georgina represent UDMH at the UN's Urban Thinkers event in Borneo, which was a fantastic opportunity, and she got to run this really interesting event about urban design and mental health. And she is going to talk to us now about the outcomes from that event and what we've learned about opportunities to think about this topic in the context of big global policy making. So welcome to the stage, Georgina. Well, thank, thank you, Leila, um, for inviting me today. Um, and as she said, I was very fortunate to go to the um, Urban Thinkers Campus, which was in Borneo in Malaysia. Um, and at this event, I uh, ran and moderated a session talking specifically about mental health. But I'm going to try and put that all into context because I know that's a lot of jargon. So for me to explain what the Urban Thinkers Campus is, I first of all need to explain what Habitat 3 is, um, and then I'll specifically talk about what happened during the mental health session, the documents that we need to consider, and then my thoughts on the actual session. So Habitat 3 is a conference on housing and sustainability in urban development, and it's run by the United Nations. It's attended by a number of different stakeholders, but mainly we're talking about um, governmental um, representatives from across the world, so it's a global event. Um, and really we're talking about, about decision makers, policy makers, um, who are attending this event. The idea is that at this event, we'll, they will talk about um, new challenges, assess progress made since uh, um, Habitat 2, and really to drill down and have political commitment from the stakeholders who attend this event. The outcome from Habitat 3 will be um, various documents talking specifically about policies and strategies on how we can create cities which are um, sustainable and, from our perspective, healthy. So what's really great about Habitat 3 is that there's a number of different opportunities for consultation from experts, from academics, from uh, grassroots organizations. So um, we, but the event Habitat 3, there is a lot of information being fed into the event to create the agenda, to create the discussion. The Urban Thinkers Campus sits here um, so the World Urban Campaign is um, an independent organization which was um, promoted by the United Nations to try and create um, events where there can be knowledge exchange, where there can be discussion about the issues that they need to consider in Habitat 3. So at the Urban Thinkers Campus, there were a number of different stakeholders who were contributing to different discussions and the outcome is to consider this document the city we need and the city we need feeds directly into habitat 3 so the urban thinkers campus that i attended was specifically on health and well-being interestingly i was the only psychologist there and i was the only person talking about mental health considering the title is health and well-being I was quite shocked by that but I was glad I was there to make sure that I was flying the flag for mental health so there were a number of different sessions that were being run and to me that was really really useful and interesting so there were um, sessions on place making um, on integrated decision making transportation and pollution there was even a session on food which I thought was interesting 
there are a number of different stakeholders and attendees. So we had academics, we had governmental representatives, we had NGOs, as well as people from local authorities. So as I said, there, are, there was one particular document they wanted us to consider, which we'll speak about in a bit more detail. And the fantastic thing about the event is that we were consulted. So it wasn't just that we were given this document and told, right, this is going to go to Habitat 3. We were given the opportunity to give feedback, and that's exactly what we did. We changed loads of the content and even the phrasing that was used, and it was fantastic to have that opportunity and the forum to do that. We also, so all these sessions along this side were moderated sessions. In that, it was all about discussion. We have people from different backgrounds, different disciplines, and we can discuss a specific topic. And from those discussions, we had reports um, from the sessions, which then feed into the overall report for the Urban Thinkers Campus. What was fantastic from um, my perspective and for the Centre for Urban Design and Mental Health was that I was invited to a specific session on knowledge gaps. So they wanted to identify what are the knowledge gaps when we think about health and well-being in the urban environment. So I was able to bring mental health up as a specific issue. So in terms of the moderated session, it was creating mentally healthy cities. We um, spoke specifically about what do we mean by mental health, but really the discussion was about what can we do to make our environment um, in terms of physical um, features to make it a more social environment? How can we promote positive social interactions? And this is one of the um, charts that we came up with, which I think is fairly comprehensive, but I'm sure most of you and from the talks today can see that there isn't actually anything new um, that's being identified, but it's great that people from all different backgrounds are coming up with the same um, issues, such as public meeting spaces, um, community centres, it could also be indoor or outdoor. For me, the most interesting discussion that we had was surrounding why we think there are barriers to raising the issue of mental health in urban design. And out of that discussion, the key thing was a lack of understanding of what is meant by mental health and the stigma that is associated with mental health. And when we're talking about this from a global, on a global scale, there are some communities where they struggle to talk about the issue of mental health. So we then, I'm one of those people, I don't like to just identify problems, I like to identify solutions. So we had a really useful discussion about what can we do to rectify this problem. So one of the things was that there seems to be a lack of training for people who are responsible for designing our cities and making those decisions. So maybe what we could do is to think about how could we offer an optional module on the core training courses? Could we offer continued uh, professional development programs that consider urban design and mental health? And for me, that was one of the most positive outcomes from the session. So as I highlighted earlier on, there are a number of documents that were um, circulated during the event that we were able to read and provide some feedback on. The good thing is that there were clear sections specifically on health and well-being and where there was mention of mental health and how we should be considering social interactions um, and designing cities which promote well-being. The most important document is the city that we need, and there were a number of different um, topics and subsections, one specifically on creating a healthy city, and what we have here is a discussion of the physical environment and how that could impact on our health and well-being, psychological well-being and mental health. But what was interesting to me in all of these documents is the issues that we've highlighted today, talking about placemaking, talking about designing environments that promote pro-sociality and positive social interactions and um, 
active transportation. That was kind of woven into loads of different sections, and that was really reassuring for me. So I felt that a lot of um, what I wanted to raise at the Urban Thinkers Campus was already being thought about by the delegates, but in a completely different context, maybe just focusing on health rather than mental health. And for me, that, that got me to think about, well, how are we going to integrate mental health into the agenda so it's just not health? And I think the key thing um, that we've heard today, and one of the take-home messages, is that there is no health without mental health. We see really high rates of um, physical health problems among people who have a diagnosis of a mental health problem. And actually, people with, with mental health problems will die up to 18 years younger than someone who doesn't have a diagnosis. And these are not for reasons of suicide, for example. There is evidence to show that they are dying because of physical health problems. So you can't think of one without the other. They really do overlap. 